Welcome to the 2012 J. Robert Oppenheimer Lecture. I'm Marvin Cohn, and it's been my great pleasure to serve on the Oppenheimer Lecture Committee since its inception in 1998. I've also enjoyed the opportunity each year to give you an extended introduction with some personal comments about physics or Oppenheimer or about the subject of the lecture. We've been privileged to have some of the world's outstanding physicists delivering lectures to us in this series. Murray Gelman, Kip Thorne, Freeman Dyson, Chen Ning Yang, Robert Laughlin, Bruno Zamino, who's here tonight, Edward Witten, Martin Rees, Michael Fisher, Stephen Hawking, David Merman, Claude Cohn Tanuji, Frank Wilczek, Lisa Randall. And this evening, Professor Gerhard Etouf will deliver the 15th Oppenheimer Lecture. Professor Etouf is our sixth Nobel Laureate in this series, and we are delighted to have him here today. On behalf of the Physics Department, let me repeat my yearly invitation to you to see the Oppenheimer's displays that the department has covering the time when he was here from 1929 to 1943. You are welcome to visit the area in Old Lacan Hall. There are historical artifacts, letters, a plaque, a number of memorabilia, and on the fourth floor of Old Lacan, uh, there are showcases with various things. His old office was 435 Lacan Hall. For those of you who would like to learn even more about Oppenheimer, there's considerable information on the web. His picture was up, is up there. And there, is, uh, there are many books. There's television documentaries. There's dramas, at least one play, and at least one opera. So his legend lives on, and we continue to celebrate his Berkeley connection. Last year, I speculated about what Oppenheimer would have thought about our series of lectures. I divided the previous subjects of lectures into two groups. The first group had complexity, emergence, statistical physics, the spookiness of quantum mechanics, the quantum behavior of atoms interacting with light. These subjects can be roughly grouped into the branches of physics called condensed matter physics in an area called AMO that covers the physics of atomic, molecular, and optical phenomena. The second group covers gravity, black holes, cosmology, particle physics, and string theory. And the subject of our lecture tonight belongs in the second group. Although I concluded last year that I thought that our coverage would have pleased Oppenheimer, I have been reminded by colleagues that tonight's lecture and the last two by Frank Wilczek and Lisa Randall have focused on research connected with the Large Hadron Collider, the LHC, with considerable emphasis on the search for the Higgs particle. And then the question was posed to me about whether this area is really that important. Well, I feel that it is. First of all, currently there is significant public interest in this area of physics. One sees many articles on this subject in the press and even in popular magazines. For example, there is the recent Time Magazine article, Hunting the Higgs, which has quotes from our own colleague, Professor Beta Heinemann. And one new thing that I learned from that Times, Time article was, and I hasten to say that I haven't checked this out, so I can't confirm it, but this is what Time says. They said that, when Leon Letterman was complaining about the difficulty of finding the Higgs particle, he nicknamed it the goddamn particle. <laughs> Time goes on to say his publishers cleaned that up for his popular 1993 book, The God Particle. And, <laughs> and then they say that's a name widely used by everyone except physicists. That's according to Time magazine. Well, Peter Higgs is an English theoretical physicist and an emeritus professor at the University of Edinburgh. He is best known for his 1960s proposal of broken symmetry in electroweak theory. 
this so-called Higgs mechanism, which had several inventors besides Higgs around the same time, like Robert Brout and Francois Englert, predicts the existence of a new particle, the Higgs boson. It's called the boson because it is a particle without spin. Particles without spin are called bosons. There's considerable crossover in this area of particle physics in the field I work in, condensed matter physics. In fact, when I was at Bell Laboratories, we called it the Anderson-Higgs mechanism after Phil Anderson. But you have to remember there's an old saying that success has many fathers, but failures are orphans. So the Higgs, by that measure, is a success, at least as a theory so far. Now, since symmetry will be part of Professor Atuf's lecture, let me take this opportunity to acknowledge the great contributions in this area of a not so well-known woman mathematician scientist, Emily Nurter. Almost all and perhaps all areas of physics incorporate symmetry considerations as a tool to gain insight into physical phenomena. The study of symmetries and how they are broken is a central area in theoretical physics. In the March 27th Science Times section of the New York Times, there is a nice article about the career of Emily Nurter, spelled N-O-E-T-H-E-R. The question is raised about whether her work on symmetry is more important than Einstein's theory of relativity. They quote Einstein as saying that Nurter is the most significant and creative female mathematician of all time. And the New York Times goes on to say that others of her contemporaries were inclined to drop the modification by sex. They should have said gender, but as you know, the copy editors these days at the New York Times are not what they used to be. Nurter unified th symmetry in nature with conservation laws. When there is a symmetry or a homogeneous property of a physical system, there is a conservation law of some kind associated with it. We all know that energy is conserved. It can be changed into mass, it can change in form, but you don't lose it, despite what is stated in the opening lines of the opera about Oppenheimer called Dr. Atomic. Which, where they actually violate this principle. But anyway, Nurter associated conservation of energy with the fact that physical processes are independent of time. That is, the same physics applies to physics events, whether it's a Monday or a Tuesday. For another example, the radial symmetry of a rotating top or a bicycle wheel keeps angular momentum conserved or constant, so that's symmetry results in a conservation law. And as a result, these objects don't fall. And there are many other examples. If you break a symmetry, there can be important consequences. When you hear more about this in today's lecture, please remember Emmy Nurter did some of the path-breaking work while she dealt with difficulties because of her gender. I hope her example will encourage more young women to choose scientific careers. The Higgs boson make the Higgs bosons make up a vacuum all around us. And according to Higgs, it is the coupling to this boson that is responsible for giving mass to particles, and hence the larger objects like us. So if you're having weight problems, it may be your coupling to the Higgs that should be turned down. But before I leave the details about the properties of the Higgs to Professor Atouf, let me make a few comments. People often ask, what are the chances that the Higgs boson will be found? And if it is, will it solve a lot of problems? The trouble with producing and finding a Higgs particle is that it has no charge, it has no spin, and it's therefore very difficult to couple to. And Peter Higgs equations describing these particles they don't pin down the mass. They don't give you the exact value of the mass, so you don't know where to look. So finding one Higgs uh, will be a, a great achievement, and that's the simplest scenario. Uh, if finding the Higgs mass, if they find this Higgs mass in a certain range, it might open the door for many other symmetries, in particular other theories, for example, supersymmetry, 
And that would make many of us happy since our colleague Bruno Zemino is one of the fathers of the theory of supersymmetry. However, it may turn out that there are several Higgs bosons with different masses. And that would make the search much harder. And if no Higgs particles are found at the LHC, that would be something because we would need some creative retooling on the theory side. But let's assume that at least one more, one Higgs particle is found. Given that, I would like to repeat what I said last year, which was to assure our students that even if the LHC verifies some of the so-called ultimate laws, don't stop your studies in research in physics. There is still an enormous amount of exciting and fundamental work left for you to do. I emphasize again that if the theorists' LHC dreams are all realized, future researchers, like our graduate students, will in some sense have a better alphabet to create physics in their own words using this alphabet. Physics will not be finished. Well, Gerard de Toof was born in Den Helder in the Netherlands. He is an emeritus professor at Utrecht University, where he received his PhD in 1969. He shared the 1999 Nobel Physics Prize in, with his thesis advisor, Martin Veltman, for elucidating the quantum structure of electroweak interactions. Professor Atuf works, his work concentrates on gauge theory, black holes, quantum gravity, and fundamental aspects of quantum mechanics. His contributions to physics include a proof that gauge theories are renormalizable, which was an incredibly important achievement. He works on dimensional regularization and the holographic principle. After obtaining his doctorate, uh, Atuf went to CERN in Geneva, where he had a fellowship. CERN is where the LHC is now. In 1974, he returned to Utrecht, where he became an assistant professor. He then took some visiting positions, and after spending some time at Stanford and Harvard, he returned to Utrecht in 1977, where he was made full professor, and he became an emeritus professor last July. In the past, I usually add a personal note when introducing the Oppenheimer lecturer, but Professor Atuft is the first Oppenheimer lecturer I hadn't met previously. We met just today. However, let me remark that because of his unusual website, I feel that I know much more about him than just about his physics accomplishments. He is a proud grandfather with pictures of his family and other information about them on his website, mixed in with articles in physics and pictures of physics events. I found considerable information about his life and some discussion of his writings, including his published books, fairy tales, and some discussions of his recent book, Playing with Planets. From the web website, which I recommend that you visit, one quickly realizes that Gerard de Tuft is a multi-dimensional person with many interests and accomplishments. And now I'm very happy to be able to leave the internet virtual world and to have the opportunity of presenting Professor Atuf to you in the flesh. His lecture is titled, The Higgs Particle, Pivot of Symmetry and Mass. Thank you very much for this uh, very uh, kind and generous introduction. I wonder if someone can help me with this. Ah, yeah. um, so uh, it is indeed my honor to uh, be invited here and to give a lecture in the name of such an important and influential scientist. Um, 
who, uh, of course, you all know from the history books a great deal. Um, him being um, associated with a military project in uh, um, the so-called Manhattan Project reminds you of a military man who explained to his uh, officers uh, how to give a good lecture. And his, his recommendation was as follows. First, you tell them what you're going to tell them. Next, you tell them, and then you tell them what you told them. <laughs> and um, so um, here is what I'm going to tell you, but I'm not <laughs> going to read during this, all, this list. I might not even reach further than a little bit beyond halfway, because then my time will be over, and you'll start shouting that I should stop. So uh, I'll see how far I'll get. The main message, however, that I think is very important, I want to say right now. The main message is that um, the Higgs particle as such has nothing to do with God or anything like that. Um, and it isn't even a particle that generates mass. That is folklore. It has been invented much later when in the early days uh, we all talked about the Higgs mechanism and the importance of finding the Higgs particle. Nobody was saying that the Higgs was generating mass. It was a particle needed for our theories to work. It is that simple. We have explanations of everything in the theory, and in particular, we have a very delicate theoretical construction called quantum field theory. And it was in my time that quantum field theory suddenly made a, bit, a big surge in importance. We all realized this is the way to describe and understand fundamental particles. And um, when we look at the particles around us and we, we analyze very carefully all the experimental data, we discover that there is an important notion missing. And there is a problem with the mass of many particles. That problem is not only a problem with their mass, but also a problem with their spin. Elementary particles do something that all objects in the physical world do if you hang them around in free space. They rotate. Some rotate fast, some rotate slowly. But planets and stars rotate. Soccer balls and tennis balls, when you play games, they rotate. And when you play snooker uh, or, or curling, this, all these things they always rotate. Elementary particles also rotate. And it is when we try to describe the role played by their rotation, it's a very important role, by the way. You know very well that if someone plays soccer or football, and if this ball rotates very fast, it affects its orbit. It also affects, in the case of tennis, it affects the way it bounces against other objects. So. Um, spin plays an important role in the way things behave, in the way things move. So by studying carefully how elementary particles in a subatomic world, how they move, how they collide, you can say something about how they spin. And uh, the, the real message I want to explain to you is that this spinning motion is so essential in our theories of describing how these particles exert forces upon one another that it was discovered that to describe their mass while they are spinning gave rise to a problem. And how to solve that problem, well, the, what we now call the Higgs particle turns out to be a solution of that. So does the Higgs generate mass? I would say no. But uh, it certainly is very strongly related to the mass that all the particles have. And that I want to explain. So, uh, my story begins with the landscape way above um, the a, a region. What's happening here? <laughs> oh, it was good now? Here it is. Okay. Um, so uh, my story begins with the landscape high, uh, as seen from high above that um, is uh, more or less along the boundary between Switzerland and France. What you see at the on the background is the Alps. One of the highest peaks there is the Mont Blanc. 
uh, one of the highest peaks in Europe. It's the highest peak of Western Europe. And um, more in front, you see a, a lake that's uh, Lac Le Mans, the Lake of Geneva here. There's a very famous fountain here uh, near this lake. This is the town of Geneva right here. And when you are in an airplane and you look down at the countryside below you, there's one thing you will not see, and that is that red circle that I drew there. The reason why you will not see it is that it is underground. Uh, some uh, 100 meters, uh, uh, at some places, some 300 yards underneath the ground. Uh, other places, uh, well, depending on the shape, on the height of the landscape, it is uh, less deep. But and the circle is very slightly tilted, and it has a circumference of, of over 26 kilometers, and that is over 16 miles. What you definitely don't see from the airplane is that inside this uh, the, the, this uh, underground tunnel, there are bunches of particles going in opposite directions, hitting each other at various places. So the design is such that these particles usually miss each other, except when they come in one of those six points around the circle. That's where these particles are actually made to collide. And it is there that we are studying what happens. Um, what this thing actually is, is a gigantic microscope. It looks at smaller distance scales than anything else we can make in the physical world. Now, since this thing is underground, the locals here will hardly notice that there's anything special happening beneath their feet. Oh, I should first say that um, the machine here uh, started out in 1989 as a large electron-positron collider. Electrons are the the carries of electric charge in, in any substance. The positrons are the antiparticles. They were first made to collide at gigantic energies, and the thing already acted as one of the world's biggest microscopes. But then later, uh, it, the lab was taken out of the tunnel, and the tunnel was replaced by a different machine called LHC, the Large Hadron Collider. It didn't have electrons and anti-electrons, called positrons, to collide against each other, but it had protons instead. Now, protons are nearly 2,000 times heavier than electrons. Colli colliding them, or sending them around in circles, gives rise to collisions that have correspondingly more energy when you um, when they hit each other, and uh, they can be made to collide at such great force that this became an even more powerful microscope. Now, what I wanted to say just before was that the local population will notice very little of what happens beneath their feet. Uh, they would not notice anything, except every now and then some gigantic transfer that comes by their homes. And this is just one of those little devices that is needed in CERN to analyze the particles that go through. You see everything is big in this machine. The tunnel is enormous in size. If you look inside the tunnel, uh, you see something like this. This is actually taken by a Taylor lens because you already see the curvature of the tunnel, but the tunnel is very long, so, uh, um, so this is seen at, at a distance. Actually, in these blue monsters that you see in front are magnets each of them being 15 meters long and weighing 35 tons or some, so something of that order. And uh, the whole thing is filled with nearly 2,000 such magnets. Those magnets are needed to force the particles to go around and not to just move straight onwards. Um, you certainly need um, uh, motorized transport if you want to go somewhere in the tunnel. So, um, yes, this thing is a gigantic microscope investigating the uh, features of the particles and trying to improve our understanding of what happens in the subatomic world. Now, to explain what we like to investigate, I have to go back a bit in history. Now, I like to go back to the year 1969 for two reasons. Uh, one is that uh, it was a time that I started to become 
a, a professional physicist studying the subatomic world. And the other is that it is a very interesting moment in the history of particle physics when life looked very different for particle physicists in those days than it does now. In those days, in 1969, we had a fairly simple picture of the subatomic particles. We had a particle that generates the electric force, and that's just one single quantum particle called the photon, indicated by the Greek letter gamma. It is a boson, but that was a one little thing I have to correct from my uh, introduction. Not all bosons have spin zero, but all bosons have integer amounts of spin. So zero or one or two. This, fo this photon is also a boson, but it has spin one. Um, now other particles have non-integer spin, spin uh, integer plus one half. Those are called fermions, and a specific group of them is called leptons. You see, the elementary particle physicists in those days did the same things as biologists, botanists, and zoologists do. When they see an animal, they try to, to place it somewhere in the landscape of animals. So they give animals names, and they group them in families and genera and such. We do the same thing with the particles. So leptons formed a family there, and, and among those families, there are even closer related leptons. We draw a box around them, indicate that they are closer related. So the electron, indicated by the letter E, is closely related to a neutrino, and in particular, we call it the neutrino of the electron type. It means that electrons can make very easily transitions into those neutrinos and back. There was another lepton called muon, which was 200 times heavier than the electron, and it comes with its own neutrino. That was what we knew in those days about the particles. And we had then another group of particles, another genus, say, uh, like plants and animals. And uh, so uh, we had the hadrons, uh, a little bit like the animals among the subatomic particles. They are strongly interacting particles. And the hadrons came again in two families. The mesons, which are bosons, they have integer spin. And the baryons, which are fermions, because they have half-odd integer spin. Either spin one half, or, or some of them have spin three halves. And actually, what you could also do, is not indicated here, you could put those particles in an excited state. When they were colliding very hard, then spin particles would either spin harder, or they would carry some intrinsic extra vibrational energy, so they would become heavier because of that. Those particles are not indicated because they are clearly excited states of these particles, they would very quickly decay back into this basic form. And the other thing not yet mentioned, I'll do that now, is that every particle comes as an antiparticle. So the model also says, oh, the model also says that the particles have antiparticles. Not the mesons, they are their own antiparticles. So the pi plus is the antiparticle of pi minus. So no need to indicate those separately. But the proton had the antiproton, neutron have antineutrons. Omega minus has the anti-omega, which therefore carries a positive electric charge rather than negative, and so on and on. And those things have spin three halves. And apart from those excited states, which were very short-lived, this was the entire picture of the subatomic world. And we thought it was complicated enough, but now we know this was a great simplification. There was much more to come. And in a very short time, particle physics expanded enormously, both from theory and from experiment. But in those days, theory and experiment were still very close together. When we theorists made some prediction, experimentalists would immediately try to verify whether the prediction was correct. And the converse, if the experiment, experimental search found something new, we theorists all jumped upon it to try to explain that in terms of our newest theories. Unfortunately, today the situation is quite different. Theorists think about things that no experimentalists usually can investigate in as much detail as they want. Whereas experimentalists do very interesting experimental work, but only very few in theorists are directly interested in that. They mostly say, well, you know, we don't understand exactly what you're seeing, but we are actually interested in something else. And many theorists, which really are drifting apart. But, of course, uh, 
still there is a lot of connect, direct connection as well between theories and experiment. And the LHC is therefore still something which you're all extremely interested in because they hope, hopefully will open up a new domain of the physical world. The, um, uh, s the energy by which the particles are being accelerated in the LHC is nearly an order of magnitude more than what has been accelerated before. And because of that, we hope to uncover a new domain of the physical world not known of before. Astronomers all, always tell us that don't worry, you'll discover things because when we make a telescope and suddenly a new telescope comes which is 10 times the uh, resolving power, we make new discoveries all over the place. The universe is very large. But of course, if you make a telescope 10 times as powerful, the universe becomes 10 times as large. If we make our accelerator 10 times as powerful, our universe becomes 10 times smaller because we're looking at smaller things. So it's not obvious that we'll make new discoveries, but the odds are very much in our favor. So first thing you have to understand when you d uh, describe and investigate subatomic particles is the way that forces among these particles act. So one of the first forces that um, we investigate would be electromagnetic forces, but there are other forces as well. So, uh, and already in 1969, we knew that basically there are four kinds of forces. The electromagnetic force, which we all understood pretty well as being an example of a, uh, a force that we also see in, in daily life. Electric forces you feel and when the weather is dry, you try to comb your hair, then you see that hair is attracted to the comb. That's electricity. Magnetic forces, of course, you also are familiar with. We all know what it feels like to have a magnet, two magnets in your hands. You feel the magnetic force. The other two forces, strong and weak, are only reserved for the subatomic particles. They are only important in the subatomic world, but they are practically never seen beyond that. Uh, and then there's gravity, which is again very, very general. So because gravity and electromagnetism are also aspects of our world at large, they have been investigated much deeper and much more thoroughly than those other forces. So we knew those best in those days. Those other forces were still very, very mysterious. Well, the first force about which we obtained a more detailed picture was the weak force, and actually, to be honest, already a lot was known about the weak force among elementary particles. What was not yet quite understood was whether there exists only one weak force, or maybe the weak force could be a collection of many phenomena. This we did not know in those days. But there were some very striking features suggesting that the weak force was something fairly universal among these subatomic particles. Here is an example of how you notice the weak force when you do an experiment. You may notice that a, a particle such as the electron may hit one of the subatomic particles called the U particle, which is now one of the quarks. I'm, doing a, I'm a little bit anachronistic here because um, uh, quarks are actually understood also later. But now we know that electrons can hit against a U quark the U quark will change into a down quark, the electron will change into a neutrino. And that happens with a certain probability that has been measured many times, so we know precisely how strong this force is. And you could quantify that very precisely in, by using the experimental results. Now, what you can do with this interaction, you can replace the electron by its cousin, the muon, the Greek letter mu. What happens in that case, the muon will also transmute into neutrino, but of the muon type. And one always found, found that if you change one, you also change the other. So you change the electron into a muon, you also change the electron neutrino into a neutrino, neutrino of muon type. In fact, you could do something else. You could also replace them by yet another quark, like a D goes back into a U that way. And you could make the same substitutions downstairs as well. So, and this is just basically bookkeeping. You register all the weak forces that take place, and you find they always go in this sort of logic, that there's a transition downstairs and a transition upstairs, according to certain rules, certain strengths that you can measure. And then it looks as if the interaction 
consists of a, an upper part and a lower part. Knowing this, already in 1969, many investigators suspected that the weak force takes place in two steps. It's a very logical conclusion you can draw that imagine that the interaction takes place in two steps. There's one interaction on the top side of the diagram where either electrons go into neutrinos or muons go into new mu neutrinos or D goes into U and there are other possibilities. Downstairs, the same thing. And all you have to assume is that a particle is being exchanged. The exchange takes place in a very, very short amount of time, so short that it all seems to happen at one point. You can explain that if you assume that the exchange particle the easy part of the problem is to give it a name. It was called W for the carrier of the weak force. But the fact that the interaction took place in one point only indicated the weak carrier had to be a very heavy particle. If it is very heavy, lots of energy is needed to create it. It can only have a very, very short virtual lifetime. The other interaction has to take place very, very near. And you can compute these things in detail in in quantum field theory and conclude that the mass of the W had to be heavier than a certain limit, which in those days was not yet very good. Later, we could calculate the mass and measure the mass of the W much more precisely. So this was the suspicion. But now, how do we continue from here? Oh, yes, I should add that when you measure how these particles interact, you notice that the W would have to have spin. This has to do with what I said earlier about spinning particles. If a particle spins, it hits other particles in a different way than if it doesn't spin. So already we know that from the daily lives a little bit when you are good at tennis or soccer or whatever, you know that spin has an effect. Again, that effect could be measured and it could be concluded that the W had to be a boson with spin one. If, it, if this all picture is going to make any sense. Those other particles, by the way, have spin one half. Most of them have spin one half. Although you can also have zero spin objects take part in this interaction as well. Now, um, when you investigate the most fundamental particles and how they interact among the weak interactions, you always find that they are arranged in what we call doublets. An electron forms a doublet together with the electron neutrino. The muon forms a doublet with the mu neutrino. The proton forms a doublet with the neutron, so the proton can make a weak interaction into the neutron. But it was also observed that every now and then a proton made a weak interaction with another subatomic particle called capital lambda, the Greek lambda. So these interactions were observed. And something very striking was observed here, something very intriguing which was that each of these interactions took place with about the same strength. So the weak force is weak, but its weakness is quantified, and nearly the same for all these four transitions, except the last one. The last one was only 5% of the other forces, and the next to last one was nearly but not quite the same. There was a slight discrepancy between theory, what you expect, and what you found. The, the proton-neutron transition rate was a little bit less than you might have expected from this universality principle. So the weak interactions were universal, but not quite. This was a very mysterious feature of the weak force in those days. But as my thesis advisor likes to tell me a story, that he was working at CERN in Geneva, uh, somewhere before 69, and he was good friends with Nicola Cabibo, another Italian theorist who was also working at CERN at the time. And he told me that one day Nicola Cabibo came running into his office, all excited, shouting, Tini, which is the first name of my advisor, Tini, it's an angle. And Tini said, what do you mean? And Kabiwa explained the following thing. The electron to neutrino interaction is a fundamental basic weak interaction of a force that, that drives all electrons to neutrinos. All muons are driven into muon neutrinos or the other way around uh, if the weak force takes place backwards. You have, can have both things. Now, 
if you look at the force that drives the proton into a neutron, then that force is not quite oriented in the right direction. It, it drives a proton to a neutron, but 5% of the time it drives a proton to a lambda. All you have to assume that this force is a vector, and that a vector is rotated a little bit. And if you take that angle to be 13 degrees, then you can explain why the proton to lambda transition is about 5%. That goes with the sign of that angle theta, which is about 0.05 if you square it, and the cosine square is 0.95. So that means that explains why the proton to lambda force is a little bit weaker than the muon to neutrino force. And the proton, or the proton to neutron force is a little bit weaker. The proton to lambda is a, a lot weaker because its angle is fairly small. The sine of the angle is much bigger than the cosine of the angle. It is much smaller than the cosine of the angle, and that makes this difference. If you assume this thing to be an a, a rotated vector, the total length of the vector very precisely matches the total length of these other forces. What this resulted in is the notion that the weak force is not approximately universal. It is exactly universal. There's something very fundamental going on with the force. And um, so uh, now let's. What if, or, or yes, I've just indicated those percentages here. Um, so from that moment on, my thesis advisor Feldman was all convinced that we, he had to understand the riddle of the weak force. How come that uh, this is such a fundamental force? And um, he also noticed, of course, the importance of the carry of the force having spin one, because the photon is also a particle with spin one, and it is also universal. The photon, the, the strength of the photon being exchanged is directly proportional to the electric charges of the particle. So photon, photons of particles exchanged when uh, the uh, other object between which it's being exchanged each carry electric charge. So that's why a positive charge attracts a negative charge or may repel another positive charge. It's all because of the exchange of the photon. And all elementary particles carry the same amount of electric charge, or perhaps sometimes twice that, or three times that, or zero times that if it's neutral. But these electric charges seem to be very universal and fundamental. So now he said, look, the weak force is just like that. A weak particle is being exchanged, just like the photon, also carrying spin one. The only difference being that now a particle undergoes a change. An electron changes into a neutrino when a weak particle is being exchanged, whereas if a, if a photon is being exchanged, its charge remains the same. So Veldman got very intrigued by this similarity. It seems as if nature is trying to tell us something about the weak force. Now Veldman knew about a very important looking theory that had been launched uh, nearly a decade earlier, uh, in 1954. In 1954, Young and his collaborator Robert Mills were sharing an office, and so they got to talk to each other. And Young had a splendid new idea about uh, generalizing the uh, concept of electromagnetism. He said, you could imagine a electromagnetic field that is just like ordinary electromagnetism, except if a particle goes through that field, let's take a proton going through that field, the proton will transmute into a neutron while it goes through that field. In other respects, the field just looks like electricity and magnetism. Conversely, if you let a neutron go to that field, it might change into a proton again. So um, Yang struggled. And, and together with his collaborator Mills, they struggled to get the equations right. In the beginning, they made all the errors that we now don't allow graduate students to make. But that was because they were pioneers. And pioneers, when they investigate something totally new, they don't know what they are doing. And so you try everything. And Young showed me his notes when he was struggling with this concept. I don't know why he showed them to me, because those notes contained, were full of mistakes. But what, what did he know? I mean, this is the way it goes our science. If you see 
the theoretical papers by someone who pioneers something new, they make all the mistakes you can make. But then finally got everything cleared up beautifully. And the paper was published, it was a marvelous paper. And they got all the mistakes ironed out. They got a complete generalization of the old laws made way back in the 19th century by James Max Maxwell. Maxwell wrote, was the first to see what the complete set of equations are of electromagnetism. Young and Mills now did the same, but they generalized it. They introduced more kinds of electric and magnetic fields, which had different properties of transmuting particles into other particles. And they found they obeyed basically the same equation. So for instance, when you try to quantize the theory, the quanta, again, will be bosons of spin one. But you may ask a question. If a neutron changes to a proton, or a proton changes to a neutron, what happens to the electric charge of this particle? How does it disappear? I thought charge was conserved. Well, Jan and Mills realized that the particles in this field ought to be quantized energy packets. So, uh, the, or I said conversely, the energy in the field ought to be quantized in packages of energy, and that's particles. So there are particles in this field, photons, but now if you assume that charged particles change to neutral particles, it means that these young Mills photons themselves must carry electric charge. And so that means that uh, you not only have these diagrams where are photons being exchanged, but now when a photon carries away charge from one side to the other side of the diagram, then it means that these things themselves are charged, so they might exchange a photon themselves. Now, so this diagram at the right is something totally new. Oh, yes, here you see. So this diagram is something new and a complication in the theory. A complication indeed, because this makes that the theory has novel features that the old the theory of electromagnetism definitely did not have. So the question was, how does it all work? And now I want to focus attention on a subtlety that the theoreticians of the early days did hardly notice. And that is that there is a property that young Mills fields have. And in fact, electromagnetism has that as well. It's a property with spin. If a spinning particle goes through a young Mills field, its spin is conserved. It keeps rotating in the same way. The particle might change direction because it's attracted or repelled by this electromagnetic field, but it doesn't change its spin. Or more precisely, it doesn't change the spin if you measure the spin along an axis which is parallel to the direction which the particle is going. So assume particle goes, goes straight upward, then it's the horizontal rotation, amount of rotation that remains the same. And but the particle can change direction because it has fields of force under the, uh, uh, under the young Mills field. If it changes direction, its spin, uh, with respect to its new direction of motion, will remain the same. Spin in direction of motion, we call it helicity. It's like a helix. And the helix remains the same when the particle goes through young Mills field. It could have been otherwise. Other bosonic fields would change the helicity of a particle. But the young Mills field doesn't. In fact, I'll say right now, the Higgs field is an example of a field which changes the helicity of a particle. But I'll leave that for later. So helicity remains the same. But this argument only holds, uh, yes, so it, uh, again, I, I, think, I think of spin as a soccer ball rotating. This property only holds if these particles are truly massless. So um, um, for massless, particles, indeed, when the spin is rotating to the left, that is a property which is separately conserved. And so maybe particles that rotate to the left all together interact differently from particles that rotate to the right. And this uh, left-right asymmetry might explain an observed phenomenon, which is that the weak interactions are not the same when you look at them in the mirror. A very striking discovery made long ago by Lee and Yang, uh, well, theoretically, the dis experimental discovery was made by C.S. Wu, um, one other female physicist with uh, a great reputation. Um, but the discovery that the weak forces left-right asymmetric 
could easily be fitted into the Young Mills theory by saying when a, spin, when a particle spins in the left, it stays spinning to the left, but it can make a certain transition. If the same particle spins to the right, it cannot make its Young Mills transition. So the Young Mills field might act totally differently on left rotating particles than it does on right rotating particles. And this feature is necessary if you want to understand why the weak force is right, left, asymmetric. So this property would later turn out to be very important. Now, this important property is only shared among particles which are massless. Because if they carry mass, then the whole picture doesn't work anymore. If these particles carry mass, you can't always define the spin along an axis by which the particle is, is moving. Because if a particle carries mass, it can move slower than the speed of light. In fact, it can stand still. And what's the direction of motion of a particle that's standing still? That's ill-defined. Yet that particle can spin. It can spin in all sorts of directions. And um, that makes that this whole argument about spin being conserved in the young Mills field breaks down if these particles carry mass. So you can do this provided that you only talk about massless particles. And this is why the original young Mills theory actually should have been described only for massless particles going through a young Mills field. If they're massive, the weak force doesn't act on them. Now we know that practically all particles are sensitive to the weak force. So this theory had it that uh, neutrinos can only rotate to the left. Right rotating neutrinos wouldn't exist at all. I say wouldn't exist because later it was found that yes, neutrinos can rotate in the other direction, but it's very rare. And in that case, they don't do anything at all in the Young Mills field as well. So they're extremely inert. But the left rotating neutrinos do exist, and electrons can make transitions into left rotating neutrinos. But then also those electrons must rotate to the left. And that explains why in the early investigations of the weak force, an asymmetry was found between left and right rotating particles. The electrons involved in the weak interactions were observed to rotate always to the left. And the neutrinos were, of course, much more difficult to observe. But when the neutrino made an electron, or again, that electron would be a left rotating electron. So this left-right asymmetry was something that forced us to think of all subatomic particles to be massless. So something was wrong, and actually two things which were wrong. One thing was about the range of the interaction. Electromagnetic particles, electromagnetic forces, have a gigantic range. Now, uh, I remember once I was in a fortunate position to witness how far magnetic fields range in the universe. I could see with my own eyes that magnetic fields go further much further than the size of the Earth. Well, what is that? Well, I was in a fortunate position to watch a solar eclipse. And I can recommend you, even if you know precisely the theory of solar eclipse is extremely simple. The moon moves in front of the sun, and that's all there is, just a geometrical effect. So why is it interesting? At first, I thought I won't go to see this eclipse. But it took place fairly close to where I live. So last moment, I decided to go have a look anyway. And I saw the solar eclipse. It was so beautiful because the moon shines in front of, sits in front of the sun. The only thing you see is the corona of the sun. And you not only you see the corona, but you see very long lines leaving the corona. Lines, well, where the shade of the corona gets a little bit different. Somehow, this is obviously a magnetic or electromagnetic effect. And you see that those electromagnetic fields of the sun range for several diameters of the sun. Now, the sun is thousands of times more bigger than the Earth. So you could see, uh, so clearly you could see uh, that these magnetic lines were ranging over enormous distances in space. So this is a marvelous sight. And obviously, then, it means that electromagnetism is a long-range force. But I also explained that the weak force is a very short-range force. In fact, it's so short-range that for a long time, it was thought that the weak force takes place in one point only. Fermi's original theory of the weak force was a one-point force, where everything happens at one point. That's because the weak force is such a short range. 
So it's totally different from electromagnetism in this respect. This was not anticipated by Young and Mills. They treated their field as if it's also a long range field. This is totally wrong. Theoretically, we realized immediately, because it's a very fundamental theoretical law, what that implies for the force carrier. The force carrier must be a particle with a high amount of mass, called the W boson. And uh, this W boson must be so heavy that it takes so much energy to transplant this weak force that it can only move a very short distance. And theoretically, that works beautifully. So all we have to say is that the young mills, that the, the boson that exchanges the weak force is a young mills particle, but for some reason, it carries mass. This mass was not in Young and Mill's original equations. And in fact, uh, when Young once gave a seminar, it was Pauli who immediately in, uh, realized there was something wrong with the theory and asked what about the mass of this particle. And Young had to confess that he, couldn't, he didn't understand where the mass comes from. The other thing that was wrong is that all particles of which the weak force acts actually do carry mass as well. So they are light usually, but they do carry mass. And because they carry mass, the argument of the left-to-right asymmetry cannot be exactly right, because a left-rotating electron is not different from a right-rotating electron. All you have to do is, is set this electron still, and then left and right means the same thing. So how come that the electron in the weak force nevertheless has a preference of rotating to the left? There was something very mysterious going on. And theoretically, we couldn't understand that. There were no, no proper equations to get this thing figured out. So there was something that had been overlooked. So, um, so uh, the, the mass of the weak force carried instead of very large, that's what I said. So something has to be done to remedy this. And then Veldman did the same thing as some very uh, famous other physicists did, Feynman and Glashow. They all agreed that, well, Young and Mills had a beautiful theory, but his equations, their equations were not quite right. You have to modify them. And so they said, just add a mass term. Because you have to add only one term to the equations that describes the mass of the carrier, and everything will be all right. So they had a new theory, the Young-Mills theory with modified Young-Mills equations. And then we just sit down and calculate what happens. So yes, you can calculate that particles can exchange Young-Mills photons, and everything seems to be in order. This was a beautiful theory for the weak force. But theoretically, we knew that if you postulate that a photon can be exchanged, you can also have multiple exchanges taking place at the same time. So for instance, while the photon is being exchanged, another photon can be exchanged as well. And doing this, that means that the diagram that describes the effect of this force is a more complicated diagram. Complications can become even more crazy when several photons are exchanged at the same time. In particular, the situation here is very complicated because a photon is being exchanged while this other photon is being exchanged, and then a third photon comes along and meddles with the whole lot in a complicated way. So what Feldman in particular realized is that the theory they had would not describe the situation right automatically. You have to wait and see and do the calculation. The calculations were so complicated that Feldman saw the necessity to do this by computer. In fact, computers in his day were not at all as well developed as computers are nowadays. So he had to, re to invent for the first time how to do mathematical symbolism on a computer. Had not been done before. He was the first to write down a, mathematical, a, a computer program that does mathematics, mathematics of all the equations that you need to solve. And this case was a tremendously complicated case. Now, first Feynman and Veldman were very excited because they discovered something beautiful. If you look at the first complication that you get if you have a multiple particle exchange, like two uh, spin one particles, spin one half particles exchange, or two boson self exchange, they form a Feynman diagram with one closed loop in it. 
and Veldman discovered that all diagrams of one closed loop beautifully arrange according to the expected role. So you can calculate what happens, and everything is fine and beautiful. So he was stubbornly uh, continuing with his calculations because he realized that it doesn't mean that if you have multiple loops, that this thing is still correct. So this is a page of one of his papers where he attacked the multi-loop problem. You see that he was struggling with something. He was inventing new other kind of ghost particles to handle the multi-loop situation. Much to his dismay, he discovered it doesn't work. These diagrams do not give the desired result. The calculations violate very important principles of nature, in particular the conservation of probability and other such properties, positive, positivity of energy and uh, locality and all these properties, they seem to be going down the drain. So this theory is bound to fail. So how come you think you're on the right path and the last moment everything goes wrong? Well, the theory isn't right. We, and the reason why the theory wasn't right was that they missed something. They missed that we actually need a new particle. What was that? Why did we need a new particle? Now I have to explain the concept of symmetry breaking. What had we overlooked? Well, uh, a theory with massive particles is sometimes fundamentally different from the theory of massless particles. The modification that Veldman and Feynman made in the young Mills equations was more profound than they realized themselves. The reason is that when a particle has mass and it has spin one, it can rotate in three different rotation modes. All atomic physicists know this. If you have a spin one atom, it can rotate in three different ways. But if a particle is massless, like a photon, it can only rotate in two different ways. The fact that a photon can rotate in two different ways actually um, can easily be checked whenever you have a Polaroid sunglasses. Or rather, you have two sets of Polaroid sunglasses, and you, you, look, you hold one against the other, and then you rotate. And you discover that in some mode, you get light through both Polaroid glasses, and when you rotate 90 degrees, all light is being filtered out, and, and no light gets through. So, um, uh, so photons have a property that changes when you rotate the source. That means there are two kinds of photons, and um, not three. So actually, the same holds for the young Mills photons. Because they are massless, they can only rotate in two ways. When you give them a mass, they can suddenly rotate in three ways. This gives an extra degree of freedom in the equations, which wasn't handled correctly. So to handle that correctly, you have to do, to do something. Again, this is a question of spin. So spin is a central theme in my talk. In the popular account of the Higgs theory, nobody talks about spin. Well, now I talk about spin, even though it's complicated. And people who are not very familiar with playing tennis, they hate spin because the ball lands somewhere else than they expect, and they lose the game. And same is true for particles. If you don't know much about them, you might neglect that they rotate, and everything lands in the wrong direction. This has to do with symmetry. Electrons turn into neutrinos, poles into neutrons, and so on. These are symmetry transformations. And the answer to the question, what did we do wrong, is we didn't take the symmetry of the problem sufficiently seriously. And this goes indeed back to Emily Nutter, who um, was the first to realize that symmetry has to do with conservation laws. Nowadays, in particle physics, we interchange those. When we talk about symmetry, sometimes we talk about the conservation law. When we talk about the conservation laws, Sometimes we mean symmetry. It's for us now become the same thing, due to Emily Neutra, in a sense. So uh, what, what is the symmetry? Well, um, uh, think of the electron and the neutrino to be one part of the same field, but the field is some vector field. If the vector is, is, is oriented in a horizontal direction, we call this thing an electron. If the vector is vertical, we call it a neutrino. Horizontal and vertical in some imaginative, uh, imaginary space, not an ordinary space, but an imaginary space. As a horizontal direction is an electron, vertically it, we call it a neutrino. The Young Mills system treats those things identically. And Young and Mills would further require that both particles are massless. And then you can make this rotation. 
Now, not only does the electron carry a mass, we didn't know whether the neutrino carries a mass or not in 1969. We thought it was massless. It's very nearly massless. But the electron carries a mass, and of course, it also carries electric charge, whereas the neutrino is, no, is neutral. So these particles are totally different. How can you make a symmetry transformation if these things are not the same? So what had to be realized is that the symmetry is broken. So um, uh, the symmetry transformation when it acts on different particles requires something that we call symmetry breaking. And here comes Mr. Peter Higgs. Peter Higgs realized uh, that symmetry breaking can take place in two different ways in particle physics. Actually, the discovery that he made was it goes back to earlier discoveries in condensed matter physics. When you study a superconductor or a magnet, you also talk about symmetry being spontaneously broken within a piece of solid material. Now Higgs realized that you can have the same phenomenon of symmetry breaking in particle physics. But to be fair, and that is also mentioned by Professor Cran, that I should also mention these other two names, Francois Englert and Robert Braut, who uh, both physicists were a bit annoyed that always Peter Higgs's name is mentioned, whereas they discovered the same thing. But they made the, the error of not emphasizing that there's also a Higgs particle, a, 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 massless, a, a massive spin zero particle that they predicted. They are more concentrating on the phenomenon of symmetry breaking itself, which is very, very important. When Nambu, the, the first person actually realized that spontaneous symmetry breaking takes place both in particle physics and elementary and in condensed matter physics. When Nambu received his Nobel Prize, he asked his younger collaborator to give his Nobel speech. Because Nambu, I think, was somewhere in the 90, his 90s when he received the Nobel Prize. He didn't feel like he could give his speech, but he left that to his collaborator, Jonah Lazzinio. And um, uh, uh, Jonah Lazzinio gave a beautiful exposition of what spontaneous symmetry breaking is. He said, imagine a vertical pole and is a, a perfect cylinder. Apart from very minor de details on the surface, it's a perfect cylinder. Suppose you uh, have, a, with a certain amount of force, you push the cylinder down. Then, if it's made of soft material, it will shrink a little bit because you're, you're, you're squeezing it. Now, that's all right, but if you squeeze it too hard, the cylinder will buckle. But in which direction will it buckle? Well, you don't know, and it doesn't matter. It can buckle in any direction, but it suddenly chooses one particular direction into which it should buckle. We call that spontaneous symmetry breaking. The symmetry is rotational symmetry of these two earlier cylinders, and the rotational symmetry is broken by the cylinder that buckles because you, your force is too great. That is spontaneous symmetry breaking, and the same phenomenon happens in particle physics as well. We like to think of another uh, analogy. Think of a particle falling in a Mexican hat. This Mexican hat is a symbol for, symbolizing a potential field that might frequently occur in the physical world. And you put a particle in the middle of the Mexican hat. Now, will it stay there forever? Well, odds are, no, it will, one day it will fall in the rim of the hat. But where in the rim will it fall? You don't know. It might fall in that direction, it might fall in the other direction. We don't know. It is a spontaneous breakdown of the rotational symmetry of the hat. Now the hat is no longer symmetric. And the Mexican wearing it, wearing it will feel the hat will form one direction. So um, this we call spontaneous symmetry breaking. And now suddenly this ball here has a new degree of freedom. It can run around in the hat, in the rim of the hat. And this running around gives rise to a new degree of freedom. And that degree of freedom could actually, in our theories, be described such a way that it describes the missing degree of freedom of this rotating W particle. The W particle now suddenly has an extra degree of freedom given to it by this Higgs field. And so now the W particle can rotate in three directions, and now it can get a mass. So to get a mass, you have to add this new field that we call the Higgs field. 
And so it turns the vector particle, uh, the, the gauge particle, the W boson, into a massive boson. So you need spontaneous symmetry to get that done. Now, in the same sense, this Higgs field will give a preferred direction in this electron neutrino space. Suppose that we say all particles that are parallel to the Higgs, we call that neutrino. And since the Higgs is neutral, the neutrino will be neutral as well. But everything orthogonal to that will carry electric charge. That's the electron. So now we can distinguish electron from neutrino because we say the Higgs has spontaneously obtained some length. It's there. Whatever that length is, whatever is parallel to that, we, could, we give it one name. If it's orthogonal, we give it another name. The orthogonal object will obey slightly different equations from the object which is parallel. So this is why the electron can become different from the neutrino. So you actually need spontaneous symmetry breakdown to have an electron different from the neutrino and nevertheless uh, uh, have it interact with the young mills field. So this actually also allowed the electron to get a mass. It also meant that the electron could go from helicity left to helicity right because it carries a mass. Now here comes in what I said about a, new, a spin zero particle. When a spin zero particle interacts with something having spin, the spin tends to flip. So a left rotating particle cannot go into a right rotating particle. So now the electron doesn't have to choose only one way to spin. Now the electron can get a mass. So due to this extra field, the electron can get a mass as well. So I said W boson gets a mass, the electron gets a mass. So just by the presence of the field, we can accommodate for massive particles. And this is the way in which this object generates a mass. I've said all this, and now again, this transparency ends with the word but. But there is one aspect of this vector field which I have not yet touched upon, which is what is the length of this vector? Is it, it can itself, the vector can be used as a coordinate frame, a preferred coordinate frame in this internal space. What does the length of this vector do? The length of the vector does nothing by way of symmetry breaking, but the length of this vector can fluctuate, can oscillate. Those fluctuations will carry energy quanta, and those energy quanta will, gen will correspond to a particle. And that is the Higgs particle. Now comes a very important question. And this question is, is rarely touched upon in a public talk. I dare to ask it anyway, because physicists do ask this question very frequently. They say, yes, but why do we have, why can't we keep the length of this vector fixed? Why can't we say, well, it always has length one, and that's it. It's a field with length one. It always has length one. So there is no degree of freedom with that length. So why do you need this Higgs particle, really? The answer to that is go to higher energies. Going to higher energies means you are going to smaller distance scales. You are probing nature even further. At very high energies, this field will start to oscillate much, much more strongly than otherwise. If it oscillates strongly, you'll have hell of a time of keeping its length fixed. It wants to oscillate. It has two degrees of freedom horizontally and vertically. It can oscillate in a horizontal direction. It can oscillate in a vertical direction. It oscillates so much that uh, you can't stop it from, from also its length from oscillating. If you try to do that, you will re you require such a strong force that our ability to make theories that make a prediction somewhere breaks down. Such a theory will not give you any predictions. The Higgs particle will run out of control. A theory where things run out of control is usually not the theory favored by theoreticians. We keep, want to keep everything under control. The only way to do that is to allow this Higgs to oscillate. How much should we allow it to oscillate? Well, you're free to choose. That means you're free to choose the mass of this Higgs particle. Massive it will be because its length is fixed, but how massive, we don't know. And this is why the Higgs particle itself is a particle whose mass we don't know. We know exactly how it generates mass for the other particles, but we don't know its own mass. So talking again about the Mexican hat, we said that this was the actual degree of freedom given to the W bosons. This is a new degree of freedom corresponding to the Higgs quantum itself. This is the Higgs particle that we wanted, that we are now predicting. So this is the nature of our prediction. This is also, by the way, the most difficult part of my talk. The rest will be easier. 
So people then started to make models. I think I have to speed up a little bit because my time is going to run over. And I'm going to run over time. I'm sorry about that. Unless someone stops me, I'll just continue. So this is the new model that is based on this principle. A model, by the way, that was independently discovered by people who were actually practically their roommates, uh, Glasha and Weinberg, were sitting in the same building while they independently made their own model. But Weinberg, in particular, wrote down a model. And he, he explained that left rotating leptons uh, are in doublets, right rotating leptons are in singlets. That's why they interact differently in the young Mills field. You have the W particles, and you needed a third one, a neutral object. Uh, for the weak force. That was a basic new prediction of the theory. And the other basic new prediction is this Higgs particle. So Weinberg wrote down this most explicit model. Weinberg was a smart man. Why was he so smart? He said, it's a model for leptons. I'm not going to include the hadronic particles. All the others would say, why not? Wait a minute. Hadrons also are sensitive to the weak force. Why don't you include them? Weinberg said, I don't understand the hadrons. He was right about that. He didn't understand the hadrons. Something was missing, but that was something he couldn't have known. The chimed quark was a new invention yet to be made. Without chimed quarks, indeed, the hadrons are impossible to, to uh, force in, in the, to forge in the same uh, model. Uh, because Weinberg knew, realized immediately, if he would try to do that, his model would predict things that weren't true. And experimentalists knew that certain transitions do not take place, which he would have predicted with his model. So he said, I don't understand the hadrons. I'll leave them out. That was perfectly correct. The leptons are described in this model. The hadrons are only correctly described if you add new quarks to the hadronic world that were not yet known about. Now the counting goes right. At very high energies, the Higgs field fluctuates so much that you don't notice the symmetry breaking. So basically, you have four field components of the Higgs. I cheated a little bit when I drew it in two-dimensional space. I should have had a four-dimensional screen to describe the Higgs completely. It has four components. And if you do the counting, the Young-Mills fields each have only two components. They behave like massless particles. So there are three of them. So three times two is the Young-Mills particles. Four times one is the Higgs field, altogether 10 degrees of freedom, if you do the arithmetic fast enough. And at large instances, you do notice the spontaneous symmetry breaking. Then the young males fields all become massive. Each of them can rotate in three directions. We have three species of them, altogether nine components of the young males field. And the Higgs, only the neutral part of the field survives as a physically observable particle. So one Higgs particle and nine Young Mills modes, again, 10 degrees of freedom. Now the counting matches and now the theory works. The equations can be understood and there's no internal discrepancy anymore. So now we understood how to do this. Lab had one major reason of existence, which is to discover the W particle explicitly by doing explicit measurements. This is so-called cross-section of electrons colliding against anti-electrons. The cross-section had been measured before in other machines, notably in Germany, Doris and Petra. And then other laboratories joined in to measure the cross-section, effective cross-section of the electron when it collides and gives hadrons, or when it collides and gives muons, or when the electrons and positrons collide and give photons. They measured those amplitudes. And LAB continued to measure those amplitudes and found gigantic peaks gigantic, because at the left is a logarithmic scale. So you see that the peak increased by more than a factor 100, the effective cross-section of the electron against the positron. That peak is, called, is at 90 GeV, exactly the mass of the so-called Z particle, the new particle predicted in the weinberg uh, salam model. Then, lab, then people got so excited, they said, maybe we'll see the Higgs as well if we go to high energies. So lab came in lab 2 version, which is twice as energetic. And they measured the curve. And you see how beautiful the new data of lab 2, the colored dots at the right, fit the, the experimental curve without Higgs particle. So there's no Higgs particle seen in lab 2. So this is when 
uh, theoreticians uh, well, uh, urged experimentalists to go to higher energies and find the Higgs. They realized that you have to do hadrons to go to higher energies in that tunnel. This is a famous plot that you see all over the pages. Uh, in the early days, uh, LAP and other machines had excluded the existence of Higgs below about 100 GeV in mass. But very heavy masses were allowed. This parabola that you see here was actually the best fit, describes the best fit to all the precision measurements that could be done in those days. And the best fit is where the line touches the horizontal axis. It's actually a little bit below 100, but actually uh, when the best fit is better than, than about number two, the theory is still credible. So the Higgs mass could in principle be 200 or, th or 300 or so GeV. If it's heavier than that, agreement with experiment become, and precision measurements and calculations becomes less good. But maybe someone goofed somewhere, and maybe uh, the Higgs is heavier, but then we have to explain why these calculations do not agree so well. Nowadays, situation improved a lot. And with the new machines, uh, both Fermilab and, and CERN have also excluded other domains of the Higgs mass. There's a very tiny white region uh, around 125, which is kept white because it saw a slightly enhanced signal in that region, which tells you that we cannot exclude the possibility that the Higgs sits there. It's still possible. LHC is running again today at higher energies than ever before, so we hope that very soon LHC will manage to close this gap, either with or without discovering the Higgs particle. To explain a little bit how difficult it is to do the experiments, here you see the, one of the detectors at CERN being built. It's still largely empty, because this whole thing is got later going to be filled with electronics. To illustrate how big this machine is, you have to realize that there are actually some people standing here. There's a man standing here. So compared to the man, you see how gigantically big these machines are. Again, the machine is big because it's a bigger machine. You can detect much more with a small machine. This holds for astronomy, for all branches of physics holds. The bigger the machine is that you make, the more sensitive it will be. So uh, creatures. I think this also explains why in bio biology, animals become bigger and bigger and bigger. So uh, dinosaurs became so big because they have big eyes, they have much more sensitive uh, detection organs than smaller animals have. A fly can see another fly not, sh more, not sharper than we can. In fact, other flies see other flies much less well than we can. So for instance, a fly doesn't see a spider's web because the eyes aren't so good. So that's why a, a spider can catch flies. Uh, but that's because the eyes are so small. Our eyes are bigger, and so we can see the spider's web. We don't understand why the fly goes into the web anyway. But um, the bigger the machine, the better the detection. So the very biggest machines are needed to look at the very tiniest particles. This is the a simulated event. If Higgs is found, it would look something like this, a gigantically complicated uh, interaction process. Somewhere in all these tracks are the debris of the Higgs decaying. You can show that the Higgs will be a very short-lived particle if it exists. It will decay immediately. We have to find its decay products. Some are hidden in here. You need gigantically strong and fast computers because uh, CERN is, is, is providing millions of collisions per second. And all these collisions look as complicated as this. They have to be analyzed in real time as fast as possible because you can't keep all those data in your computer. That would be hopeless far too many. So you have to analyze as fast as you can whether possibly there could be a Higgs or something else of interest in there. Now I talk about a little thing that happened in shortly after LHC was switched on for the first time. And I see you getting impatient. So the story. <laughs> The story of the accident will have to be kept very short. But I like to tell the story because it illustrates how well CERN is being managed. I'm very proud of being European in this particular respect. Not about the way Europeans handle finances, but the way they handle mishaps like here is, is very admirable. And this, well, you see that something happened here is not so good. Actually, an explosion took place. What was the explosion? Well. 
the next picture shows that um, uh, there was a bad contact. These 2,000 magnets all carry dozens and dozens of contacts where room temperature leads have to contact with, temp with leads which are at 1.9 Kelvin. Those contacts have to be flawless. If they're not flawless, they, they will show some resistance, and then things will melt, and the contact will be broken. Now, if you have a magnet carrying megajoules of magnetic energy, you can try to break the contact and stop the current, but that means you stop the magnetic, the magnetic field in there, which carries megajoules of energy. That current cannot be stopped instantly. The current will go on for another minute or so, no matter where it comes from. So a spark is made. The spark continues the current in spite of the original contact being broken. The spark will do the same thing as in a bad science fiction movie. It will start to do this. And finally, this spark did something which was not anticipated by the CERN designers, which was it hit a helium pipe. Now, there are many helium pipes in this magnet, all being very fragile. And that made sure if one of these fragile pipes breaks, there will be no big problem. But they had not anticipated that the spark of a bad contact would hit one of the main helium pipes beside the magnet. This helium is super cooled to 1.9 Kelvin, but when the spark hits the helium pipe, it suddenly is heated beyond its transition temperature, so its, its evaporation temperature, so that the helium instantly evaporates. When helium evaporates, its volume increases by a factor 1,000. If that happens instantly, that's the definition of an explosion. And that explosion took one of these 35 ton weighing magnets to lift it up by half a meter or so and put it down somewhere else. That is not good for an accelerator. <laughs> and uh, in fact, then the next magnet underwent problems as well. All in all, some 60 magnets in a row were being damaged by this event and had to be replaced. The replacement itself was not that terrible. It took them only a few months to have everything back in working condition again. What took them over a year was this incident came unannounced and unexpected. It was the fact that it was unexpected which caused them to worry. We made a calculational error. We want to make sure this error doesn't take place again. So it took over a year to fill all these magnets with new detectors to make sure that, uh, that what happened then doesn't happen again. They investigated all magnets. They found another magnet where the same mistake had been made, but that magnet had not yet exploded. It could have done, but it didn't. Uh, so, but they analyzed and found the origin of the error, and they, they are now making sure that the error doesn't take place again, but they're still not quite sure. That's why LHC today run, still runs not quite at the design uh, energy, but a little bit lower, just to be on the safe side. In 2013, for the first time, uh, LHC will run at a full design uh, capacity. Some statistics here, some uh, superlatives, many superlatives, but I, uh, well, I, I think I should actually stop. This is the competition Fermilab, and in good science, you have competition and collaboration going side by side. So we collaborate with Fermilab, we compete with them at the same time. But now Europe is in a better position than Fermilab to do the high energy measurements. So that machine is now closing down and still analyzing some of its data. But otherwise, it's uh, no longer in operation at that high energy. Fermilab reached only one TeV, whereas CERN has four TeV in its beams now, and it will continue to go all the way to seven. What if the Higgs is not found? Well, our theories will be in serious trouble, but maybe we just have to modify them. Maybe there exists more than one Higgs. Could be, then finding that those Higgses will be much more difficult. There will be several particles which, which share the job of doing the symmetry breaking among all five of them or so, and that makes each single one of them more difficult to detect. That could happen. There could be very many Higgses. There could be an infinite number of Higgses even, or something else could happen. Absolutely no Higgs at all, 
That would be unlikely. Again, the theory would be entirely wrong. But the theory has served us so well in previous years that many, many theoreticians think that is unlikely. It's not totally impossible, but then we've overlooked something much more serious, and we'll have to do our homework all over again. We don't mind doing that, so if experimentalists tell us there is no Higgs period, well, I'm sure theoreticians will find an answer sooner or later, but that means lots and lots of work. So to go with this, there's no way we can lose it, as I said here. To go with this, um, <laughs> but I already got, this is a military guy. Uh, I should tell you what I've told you. But. Yes. We have time for just a couple of questions. So if you Maybe would line up people, over people here. People have to leave, then and I'll first leave and then. Uh, if those who have questions, please come to this microphone and form a line. Oh, yes. You, uh, you said uh, Higgs uh, generates mass. Who's asking? Because I can't see for us well from here. Right here. Oh, I'm in front. Um, you said that, that yes. right here? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, you said the, uh, the Higgs generates mass. But, but once a, uh, an object has mass, it has a whole bunch of other properties, uh, including uh, in general relativity, it'll warp time space. It'll also uh, uh, generate inertia. Uh, it'll also bend the light ray. So does, is the Higgs responsible for all these multiplicities of properties of once you have mass? Well, as I emphasized in my talk, I would rather not say that Higgs is responsible for mass. That we're giving it too much honor. It is just an ingredient in a theory necessary to describe massive particles. Now, you know probably very quite well that general relativity is a theory of the gravitational force. Today, we do not quite understand how to incorporate general relativity in particle physics. It's one of the major outstanding problems in theory today. So we can't answer your question completely. But uh, we do know, as a fact, that mass, okay, mass in this theory is inertial mass. So we always talk about inertial mass. We rarely talk about gravitational mass. But according to Einstein, and we all believe he has it basically correctly, that mass, uh, gravitational mass, inertial mass is the same thing. Uh, so uh, we believe this is true, which means that when the Higgs interacts with the particle, giving it effectively a mass, then that same mass will also be the source of a gravitational field. It goes, according to Einstein, that happens automatically. In fact, there are much more forms of energy in our theory, such as kinetic energy, which also contributes to the mass in, say, an atom. When electrons and other particles move in an atom, that kinetic energy also contributes to the mass but also contributes to the gravitational mass in the same way, according to Einstein. We have to take that, we have to take Einstein's word for it. We haven't yet fully understood how his theory has to be incorporated in particle physics. Well, you just answered my question more or less, so thank you. Thank you. Have you written this uh, talk up, or are you going to write it up someplace, and, and where are you going to write you it up? This talk? Because, um, well, this story has been told by many people in different ways. I, this is my version of the talk. I actually wasn't planning to write it down in this way. I'm talking about uh, not mainly my own research. My own research is on a different topic, but this is what I'm confronted with fairly frequently today because I'm a member of a CERN Science Policy Committee and we discuss all these things in detail. That's why I love to talk about it. That's not my own research, so I'm hesitating, hesitating a little bit to write it down. I'll just mention that the talk itself will be available on the physics department website in about a week yes, until we, so we record that. So you a literal registration of this talk will, of course, be available, yes. Um, since elementary particles can have only particular values of their rest mass, is that an example of energy quantization? Um, 
we would love to think that way, but no. Energy is quantized with only depending on frequency. So, so the quantum comes automatically with a frequency. If you change the frequency, you change the quantum of energy and then also the mass. Effectively, this means, it means that particles can have any mass in principle. There is no obvious restriction to the mass a particle can have. For instance, neutrinos are known to be very, very light. The lightest particles, which are non-zero in mass, photons is zero mass. Neutrinos are very, very light. But um, how light, we don't really know. But today, there's no theory that tells you that the mass of the neutrino must be quantized. We don't believe that. Although, in the future, maybe one day, something like this comes out. This would be a major discovery, if true. But today, we have no good mechanism to quantize mass. And this energy is quantized proportional to frequency of the source. OK, okay let's, let's thank Professor Hertoft again. Thank you.